July 28, 1914, World War I erupted, sending the men of Britain to the battlefields. As the men were drafted to fight in the war, the women at home were drafted to work in the factories. Everyday household item factories became ammunition producing factories, all to aid the war effort. World War I greatly impacted Britain. Between 1914 and 1918, over 6 million British men went off to fight the war. The Central Powers fought the Allied Powers. Britain needed everyone to pitch into the war effort. In 1914, women's roles in society were beginning to shift. This time is commonly referred to as when women, quote, came out of the kitchen, end quote. Women began replacing men by working in factories as mutinette workers. Factories that produced railroad tracks became ammunition, food, and medical supply factories. They worked in dangerous, dirty conditions. An estimate of 700,000 women started working in munition factories at this point. The daily routine for women had consisted of waking up, going to work in the factories, coming home, and continuing daily chores. Often after work, women would kick around to football sometimes even organized small games. Organizing small games spiraled into matches against the young apprentices working at their factories. At Dick Curran Co., the women football players were especially talented. Their first organized match was on Christmas Day, 1917. The Dick Kerr Lady Footballers took on Colt Arts Foundry, playing in front of a crowd of 10,000 spectators. The Dick Kerr and Co. Lady Footballers beat Coulthard's Foundry 2 to nothing. They took on the name the Dick Kerr Ladies and began their journey to becoming the best women's football team in the world for their time. Dick Kerr and Co., founded by W.B. Dick and John Kerr, two Scottish men, was the leading firm for the traction industry, responsible for electrifying the railway from Liverpool to Southport in 1904. When World War I broke out, they turned their focus to manufacturing ammunition for the war. When the war first started, some male football players stayed home to continue playing the sport they loved, but were often criticized and viewed as cowards for not going to fight for their country. For any man capable of playing football was capable of fighting in a war. When some men's football players did go to the war, many well-known idolized players died. This war led to the triumph of women's football in Britain. At the beginning of the war, football from women's standpoint was solely looked at as a big health benefit and good for their well-being. This sport helped serve as a distraction to women who now instead of focusing on this deadly war could have something to enjoy and look forward to. Between the 1914 to 1918 time period, there was a dramatic rise to the amount of women's football teams in Britain. Women factory workers organized football teams all across Britain. During their free time at work, they would kick around a football with their friends. At that time, these women had no idea where this game would lead them. The Dicker ladies, led by their manager, Alfred Franklin, gathered a national fan base almost instantly. Many people began to line up to watch their games. Their manager also worked in the Dick Kerr & Co. as a draughtsman in the number six department. One day from his window, he saw these ladies playing and instantly recognized all the true potential they had. Their first game at Deepdale on Christmas Day, 1917, they raised 600 pounds for war-related charities. During that game, they gained respect from the public, being that they were playing for war-related causes. Although the success and popularity of the Dick Kerr ladies was growing, many thought that the female frame was not built for the game and that it would cause damage to women's health. The anti-ladies football lobby voiced negative opinions about the Dick Kerr ladies. However, this did not stop the Dick Kerr ladies. On February 13, 1918, another match was approved. On March 29, 1918, the Dick Kerr ladies took on the Bolton ladies and won five to nothing. During the 1918 to 1919 season, the Dick Kerr ladies established a bigger audience. October 9th, 1918, the team had their first defeat. November 11th, 1918, World War I ended and all the soldiers returned home or were buried. 
Because of this, women also returned home, no longer working in the factories. Attitudes about women taking over the men's game began to shift, for the men were very angry that women's football was more popular than men's. On November 15, 1918, the Lancaster Daily Post reported that women were, quote, not suitable candidates for the position of a referee, end quote. In other words, women were not allowed to be the referee of a football match because they claimed they couldn't keep up with the pace of the game. This embarked the beginning of social injustice towards the women athletes. Despite differences, the Dick Kerr ladies team continued to persevere. In 1919, they signed Alice Woods to the team. Before this, she played for one of the Dick Kerr ladies' rivals, St. Helens, another munition factory women's football team. Another instrumental player was Lily Parr, a 5'10 female footballer. In her first season, she scored a whopping 43 goals and would continue to be one of the most influential female athletes of her time. As football was continuing to slowly grow in Britain, it was rapidly growing in France. The French developed a national women's team. The Dick Kerr ladies invited the French national team to come and play in Britain on a football tour. The French national team arrived in Britain on April 28, 1920. 25,000 people came to watch the Dick Kerr ladies play the French ladies. Throughout the tour, they raised over 3,000 pounds, all to dedicate to wounded warriors. In 1920, the crowds were consistently between 10 and 25,000 people. In 1929, the Dick Kerr ladies were the first female British team to travel nationally. The French national team returned the courtesy and invited the Dick Kerr ladies to play on a football tour in France. While they were in France, they were spectated by 22,000 people per game. As the male football players grew jealous of the Dick Kerr ladies' success, trouble began to arise. Medical professionals claimed that women playing football would cause infertility. Some even thought that the only place women had on sports fields was on the sidelines cheering for the men. On December 5, 1921, tragedy struck down upon the Dick Kerr ladies' football team. The Football Association put out a statement saying that women's football is, quote, quite unsuitable for females and ought not to be encouraged, end quote. In other words, the Football Association banned women's football teams from playing on the Football Association's owned grounds. Many ladies' teams gave up when the ban was passed because they didn't have fields to play on. However, the Dick Kerr ladies did not. They played despite the ban and showed persistence and pushed through the inequality when many women at the time did not. The Dick Kerr ladies owned a field of their own where they continued to host matches. However, the crowd sizes never recovered after the ban. Although they could not play on federally owned grounds, they made the best of their situation. In 1922, they toured North America because they could play in other countries. They even played against men's teams in the United States. The ban on ladies football in 1922 was a true form of injustice towards the many incredible women. A full generation of women were corrupted of their right to play the sport they loved. The team was in existence until 1965 when the team died out. The Women's Football Association was formed four years later in 1969, and the ban was lifted in 1971, which would not have been accomplished without their efforts. In 2002, Lily Parr was inducted into the Hall of Fame at the National Football Museum, being the first woman to be inducted at the time. In 2008, the Football Association put out an apology for the 1921 ban. This apology does not make up for the thousands of women whose lives were ruined because they couldn't play the game they loved. Similar to the Dick Kerr ladies, Serena and Venus Williams and Billie Jean King fought for the equal pay between men and women on the tennis court. It wasn't until 2007 when all four major tennis tournaments awarded equal prize money for male and female winners. This is similar to how the Dick Kerr ladies fought to play football in the mid-1920s alongside the men and were prevented from doing so because of social inequality. <laughs>